Central train So it's um, um, now my uh, great honor to introduce to you our uh, keynote speaker of Eurovis uh, 2018, Drew Berry. Uh, Drew Berry is from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. Uh, he is a medical animator uh, and his animations and illustrations are helping both experts and laymen uh, to understand very complex cellular and molecular processes. Um, they're actually based on scientific discoveries, but are also pieces of art in themselves, as you will, you will see today. Uh, they are found in scientific papers, as well as in many public installations uh, all over the world. Um, Drew has an, an amazing uh, track record of accomplishments, um, uh, many recognitions of his work, and as you may have seen in the program, uh, he's been uh, named the Steven Spielberg of Biomedical Animation by the New York Times, <laughs> which is amazing. Uh, he has received several prestigious awards, and for instance, the MacArthur Fellowship. And most importantly, he was also became an honorary doctor of Linköping University uh, two years ago. So, uh, if you Google uh, Drew, you will find an amazing presence out there. Uh, check out his talks uh, and all the stuff that he is going to present to you today. He has 1.7 million views on his TED Talk from 2012. Which is amazing. So we're now very pleased uh, to have Drew here. He just arrived a few minutes ago by train, so we're relieved by the fact that he's here. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to listening to Drew for uh, the next hour. Uh, his talk is uh, entitled Your Respiration Engines Real Time Visualizations of Dynamic Molecular Landscapes. So, Drew. It is to be here in Bruno. This is my third time, um, and, so, and my first time for Eurovis. So uh, I'm very, very excited to be here, and really looking forward to the whole week um, and meeting many of you um, um, and seeing what the work that you do. Um, so I'm uh, uh, very much uh, dependent um, on the sorts of tools and the capabilities that you are developing. Uh, but my foot is very much in two camps um, or three camps. Um, I depend on the tools that you are developing to recreate and reconstruct what is happening at molecular scale. Um, I've been working at this building here uh, for 20 years, uh, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. It's in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, it's, a, it's Australia's flagship center for basic research into medical biology. They do lots of research into cancer, diabetes, infectious diseases like malaria. And um, I come from a background of cell biology, microscopy. Uh, so I'm trained in being able to interpret many forms of scientific data, and that's really where my primary passion comes from. I love uh, cell and molecular biology um, and all the sorts of stories that are being discovered there. Uh, but I'm also um, coming from a, a first generation who came through having access to a computer in my bedroom, and I've been playing video games since my early teens, and uh, that has not stopped. Um, I love video games, um, not so much for the game playing, which is fun, but it's more I just love the worlds that they create, and I love the technology, and I love problem solving with the technology. Um, so my career comes from a combination of those two things, of um, uh, visualizing what can't be seen and what's being discovered, uh, and translating the discoveries of medical research into a, way, a means that the, the public can understand. Um, but really, after 20 years or more of doing these sorts of animations, so that's what you'll primarily <coughs> see if you look for me on, online, is my animations, finished movies. Um, I've, been, I've literally, in the last 12 months, dumped all of my 20 years of techno technology and techniques. It's, it's all in the past. And we're moving to a new era. And it's very much inspired by this, uh, what, what we'll call a diorama. So rather than movie animations, I'm looking to create open worlds that people can stand and, and collectively look at and interact with um, and very much inspired by this is, this is called Mountain Gorilla in the American Natural History Museum 
Uh, it's one of the many exhibitions, very famously so, that's installed at the exhibition. This was built in 1926. Um, and what you have is, you, look, you peer into a window into the exhibition and you see this 3D model. You have these lush plastic plants in the foreground. You've got this gorilla who's addressing you and very aggressively uh, pounding on his chest. You really feel a, a sense that you're uh, in, in its presence. And you have a mural, a hand-painted mural, can't quite see it there, but it's a, a volcano spewing gases in the background. But you really get a sense that you are in this, this uh, exotic location looking at this um, uh, and, and be able to uh, see what the world is like. And that is very much what I'm uh, heading towards uh, doing right now. Um, but being as a gamer, actually, could it possible to have the lights down a little bit further? Um, if it is, that'd be great. Um, I uh, have been gobsmacked, uh, amazed by, staggered by the current technology of video games. Um, and this has been, uh, probably, it is still probably my favorite game uh, ever. Um, it's called Horizon Zero Dawn. It's on, it came out last year, around January last year, um, on PlayStation 4. Um, and it has a vast, vast landscape that you can traverse and go wherever you like. And, and it has these incredible environments and environmental uh, uh, effects. You've got uh, landscapes with constant changing plants, uh, uh, 3D rocky worlds, and then lots of environmental effects. And all of it is extremely realistic. And uh, not, uh, uh, the char main character herself doesn't look photorealistic, but it's certainly compelling for storytelling. Um, but my question is, why can't, we, why can't I have access to that? Why, why can't I have that kind of level of technology, that kind of visualization capabilities? Um, because versus this sort of real-time, interactive, incredible worlds, um, I've been struggling to take molecular data and then create an animation that will show in a linear way these sorts of uh, worlds that we can't otherwise see. Um, and all right, so the main goal of um, the work, so all the work I'm about to show you is all very much a work in progress. I don't have a completed thing to show you, but I'll show you where we're at and where we're heading. And I think hopefully you'll get a sense of that. Um, I've been collaborating with uh, North Shipping uh, Visualization Center for a number of years, um, and they have a beautiful dome which they're upgrading to 8K uh, stereoscopic, so it'll be a 360 show. Um, we'll be doing full. Uh, uh, rendered finished movies, but as well, um, very interested in seeing interactive worlds. So versus going to a planetarium and they say, here's the sky in summer, and let's go to Saturn, and, and the presenter at the front controls the show, rather than going out to the stars, we'll go in, inside ourselves and see how we operate. Um, this is in my, uh, I have a, uh, a three meter vertical dome uh, installed in my office. Um, so that's me presenting in the background there with a group of students. Um, and so this three meter dome is my uh, prototypes uh, um, screen for testing stuff that would go onto the dome. And this three meter, the, the actual uh, show that's being presented there is a rhinovirus, the common cold virus, uh, in blood molecules, so the blood plasma molecules. Um, and that's a rendered movie, um, which I think. Yeah. So this, this was a movie that I created uh, a few years ago, yeah, 2014, for the Norship Bing Dome to try and uh, try to see if I turn the sound up. Just, just to see what it would be like to have being immersed in the molecular world um, in the dome when you have it at that giant spectacular scale. And these are all just tests to see um, also the, the aesthetic of molecular vibra uh, Brownian motion, stochastic motion. Is it actually uh, a pleasant place or an acceptable place to be with all these busy moving things? How, how, how would we tweak that to make it watchable, to at least convey the sense of the molecular dynamics that occur? Um, but what, I, what we found was uh, these very big close-ups, these, these individual proteins are gigantic, many, many meters across, and it was kind of unpleasant uh, to be this close to them, but some of the other visualizations at lower scale were certainly excellent. Like, they, they really were motivating, they were interesting to look at, and they really did convey the sense of, um, of what it's like. Should we play one more? Oh, this, uh, I'll, I'll go back and play this one from the start. So this, this one, uh, uh, this particular visualization, which is one that was most successful, so you have the rhinoviruses here, you've got, uh, these are all the blood molecules, uh, fibrinogen, um, and so on, all the sort of classic uh, molecules you would find. To create this, this image, I, I, I will use what I actually, unlike all of you, I'm, I will adopt any technology that will get me to the end of creating a visualization. I'm happy whatever it is. And if it's fast, if it's efficient, I can tweak it and get it done. And I wasn't sure that I would be able to create a 6K 
visualization with that many molecules on the dome. In 2014, it just it, it was beyond what my machines could do. But I found a pipeline, and essentially it was lots of instancing for those who are interested in, and I was using a very optimized rendering system called V-Ray, which is a, a, a rendering a system for Maya, and, and any other systems. Um, and uh, I was, to create this image, was cost me about $500 a night to render on a render farm. Um, and so it was going to cost tens of thousands of dollars just to compute the image, let alone the delay. So what I also didn't realize, I was using these commercial overseas render farms. Um, and you could, yeah, anyway, so it wasn't the rendering that was the problem. It was downloading these massive files backward so I could it would render and it would be done in an hour or two. Um, but then it would take me a, a 24 hours to download all the files onto my local system and manage it. So still there was a huge delay in rendering and generating images. But at least it was feasible and I could say to Anders, yes we can do this. And we were, we were underway. But then Ivan Viola turns up. And this is actually on the Norshipping Dome uh, which, in 2015. Um, and so this is taken on an iPhone so you can see the edge of the dome there. And this is every bit as good, good visual quality as I was achieving with my expensive system. And it's running in real time. And I remember just picking my jaw off the floor and went, well, that's changed the game. <laughs> and literally, that, this was the moment where I went, okay, we're, we're dumping everything I've done before. This is the new way to work. And uh, we had to find a pipeline to do these kind of visualizations in real time or re for rendering uh, on the dome. And so if we can achieve 8K stereoscopic rendering, then everything else is easily possible. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, the, the topic, uh, the story I'm working on right now is about uh, mitochondria. There are certain little organelles inside your cells. They're the power generators that they, they describe as power generators inside your cells. Lots of interesting stories to be told about them. But I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, footage of them and a little bit of the science that goes into it because that's really my concern. I'm, I'm always looking and interpreting many forms of data um, and then combining that and reinterpreting into a visualization that will make sense and reveal it to the public. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little, just a little bit of science that goes into my this particular visualization, um, starting with. Very thin margin oh, of this cell. We'll turn off the audio for this point. Uh, so these, this is a, 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 this is actually from a salamander, this particular cell, and it'd be right over there to the edge of the wall and back here. These, these little wiggly worms there, those are mitochondria. Now, why I'm kind of showing this to you is in every classic, mm -hmm. every single textbook, mitochondria are shown as these little rigid jelly beans where in fact they are extremely dynamic, they are branching, they fuse, uh, they, they are typically long, they, they adapt to whatever the cell needs. If you're a heart muscle, you need a lot of power and energy there. If you're a neuron, you need long distance energy. Uh, they change their shape and, shapes and forms. So these are containers within the cell that, that do all this power, power generation. And uh, high school kids are studying this stuff, uh, particularly for respiration, and it is a jumble of technical uh, language and chemistry that makes it impossible to learn. Um, and I remember doing it at high school and even in university and not really understanding it. Um, so that's what we're trying to tackle. Uh, this is a bit more updated uh, visualization, uh, uh, sorry, microscopy of, of mitochondria. These two spheres here are the, those are, there's two cells here. One, one sphere is a nucleus with holding all the DNA, the other cell is nucleus over there, so those voids are where the DNA is. But these little yellow jiggly things are the mitochondria, so I can access, this is from um, uh, light sheet, lattice light sheet microscopy, very advanced, very uh, current uh, types of microscopy. And I, we can extract 3D data from that, also time-lapse uh, data from that. Um, but I tend to what, then use that data, rather than using it directly, I'll reconstruct uh, the software I use, it's called Maya, and I'll reconstruct a, if you could see it, it look like this, um, a virtual version in Maya. Uh, one last uh, piece of uh, data or a visualization or uh, uh, imaging of uh, mitochondria. If you do a slice through them, you see that, so this is a, a, like a, 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 it's a transection through the mitochondria, and you can see all the different uh, membranes. There, there's sort of very ordered structures in there, and particularly these tubules inside, um, those are where the molecular machines that do respiration are uh, located. They're embedded in this membrane. But it's a very uh, complicated membrane, uh, but very, there is a definitely order and structure there. Um, oh, one last one, because I, I love these kind of, this is again electron micrographs, different slices through different cells. You've got heart cell, neurons, and so on. But what you're seeing is there's, uh, there's uh, tubules going this way, there's lots of order. Uh, I think that one up the top uh, right hand side there is inside a cardiac muscle. So very much ordered structures, but um, uh, very, very dynamic. 
and the, and the mitochondria will change to suit the needs of, this, of a particular cell that's inside. Um, another piece of data, this is a, a, a tomography data reconstructed of inside interior of a mitochondria. Um, again, these are the tubules, so it's, it's, it's a slice, uh, a, a chunk through the mitochondria. And you have these very convoluted tubule-like structures, and in, encrusted on this is where all the proteins are to do with um, respiration. The blue uh, spheres there are actually uh, the DNA, the genome of mitochondria. They, uh, mitochondria are evolved, they're endosymbionts originally from, uh, they're bacteria that in, in, uh, became a, a partnership inside the cell, but they have retained their own uh, a genome um, separate to the nucleus, uh, which has all the other, uh, the bulk of the DNA for the cell. Uh, this is a, a David Good cell visualization. This is heading towards where I'm, I'm going to have to try and reconstruct these sorts of visualizations. This is uh, David Good cell's uh, image of a mitochondria done from a bunch of years ago. So there's a couple of inaccuracies, but overall, I mean, if you have a David Good cell image, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much 90 90% uh, way, way uh, done to the project because he really lays it out as a map of the sorts of structures you just see. So uh, this big sphere here, but it's really this membrane, so it's like a transection with encrusted proteins. Uh, this is ATP synthase, the most probably most well known of the respiration um, molecular machines. But all of these are different steps, and, and uh, like, it's like a factory bringing together all these parts to do respiration. Um, but very much, uh, this is uh, the sort of density and the sort of complexity that I'd be hoping to achieve with my visualization. Um, this is from a textbook, a classic textbook. And this is literally, it's university, well, beyond university level, but this is the way it looks in high school textbook bi uh, of biology of how respiration works. All of these are different key steps, key proteins. This is the membrane uh, represented here of, of inside the interior of the mitochondria. Um, but all of these, the, essentially what you have, uh, so NADH, uh, oxidoreductase, quinone, it's, it's really, really complicated chemistry when it's described to school kids. But essentially, what, two things that are going on. You've got one little chemical reaction here, and all of the energy is dispersed through electron flows and pumping protons, getting protons from this side and pumping them to the outside. So you get a, a buildup of protein, protons on the, this side, and then the, like a water wheel, the protons running back will drive this mechanically, this motor, this ATP synthase. But this is what, how school kids currently see it, and um, I, I particularly, I, I think it's, it's, it's unfathomable. Um, particularly when it's described all the chemistry and steps that are going on. Um, ATP synthase, so that final one, uh, is a classic uh, for um, biomedical animation. It's been done many, many, many times. Probably 20 different examples I found online. Uh, Graham Johnson's early one, uh, many of you know, I'm sure, uh, are aware of Graham's work. Um, but then in Biovisions, who uh, it, it became ex vivo, uh, they did a number of visualizations. This is a particularly nice one. Um, this is uh, from Australia, where um, you have the membrane here, and then the rotating, uh, the, stepping, the stepping of the rotating uh, axis, um, because of protons flowing through, and that's causing mechanical changes here, which are mechanically forcing chemistry to happen. Um, so there are lots and lots and lots of visualizations of ATP synthase. Um, so this is the production of ATP, which is the, the key energy currency inside your cells. Uh, this is a particularly uh, good one. This is from a research paper um, looking at the mechanics. So this is the rotating stock of ATP synthase and showing the substrates coming in, the ADP and the phosphate molecule, and they're mechanically, because of this rotating this axle here, mechanically pushed together and mechanically forcing chemistry to happen. So it's using a rotating mechanical energy to form chemis chemical bonds. So all of these, this particularly this one, uh, this particular visualization, are, I, I would emulate and use to uh, build my own versions of this. Uh, a, a couple of really, this is sort of heading towards data which they never show. Um, you have again, this is a transection electron micrograph through a uh, mitochondria. Um, and what you have is those little yellow dots are actually the ATP synthase, which we've been seeing, and they form in these pairs, pairs of rows along, so this is, these are those tubule um, that I showed you earlier. There's a lot of order there. They're running along the edges of, the, of these tubules. Um, and this is just looking at uh, the reconstructing from uh, computer topography, uh, from uh, slices of EM, working out where these are those pairs of ATP synthase. And these green ones um, are the respirosomes. So they're the ones that are pumping protons inside, into the interior here of the, of the membrane, and then the, the protons flowing out then drive these uh, ATP synthase. 
So this is overall very much the sort of world that I'm, of sort of um, things I want to reveal with these kind of visualizations. Uh, this is a bit more, but it's, it's just showing more details of, uh, and, but also I, I find this interesting where, where you have the different uh, species have all sorts of variations. But what's also particularly interesting, so you have the pairs of ATP synthase here, and they're really forming this, this sort of <clears throat> a pinched, uh, very under tension uh, elbow in the membrane. And uh, one of the questions is, why does it do that? And we'll come back to that later. But then each species has, has its own variation. But this is a very conserved engine that goes back to the very origins of life on Earth, uh, or at least to bacterial forms. Um, uh, essentially, every, uh, everything from bacteria up has a variation of this particular uh, engine driving the energy production inside their cells. This is a lovely animation. This is probably the, the uh, nicest one I found of ATP synthase which does show uh, the, the pairs of ATP synthase working in tandem and the membrane, uh, 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 their, sort of the, the curve in the membrane being formed. This is from the Life of Biology of Cell, one of my favorite textbooks. Um, this is, this is a, again, another published paper showing um, the, sor the sorts of encrusting of uh, the sort of ex what we'd expect to see on a membrane um, and the amount of proteins embedded. Um, so this is actually a vesicle, which is like a sphere, uh, a membrane sphere that your cells form that do a lot of functions, primarily cargo carrying, but they may also do digestion. And in fact, in this case, it is for uh, whatever the contents are are about to be digested and broken down. And then you see this thing here, it's actually, it looks just like an ATP synthase, and that's because it's almost, almost, it's almost identical to an ATP synthase. But rather than rotating, having protons flow through and forming ATP up here, ATP is consumed, it rotates the other way and pumps protons in. So it's bi-directional. And it's all about the concentration, the gradient of protons. Um, they're trying to get uh, to equilibrate, and if, if there's more protons on one side, they'll flow. If there's more on the other, they'll flow back. So this is actually from my, uh, we, we, we adopted Cellview, um, Yvonne Viola's Cellview uh, as our rendering uh, system, um, middle of last year. And we've been developing it since as a pipeline. Everything I'm going to show you is not here for storytelling. It's simply to test the system and develop a pipeline for this kind of production. Um, and what I'm doing is just looking at the chemistry and looking at how will we frame this, how will we tell a story, but also how will it look uh, in the visualization. This, this was an early one, I think, from, actually, on, early this, the earliest year, probably late last year, of ATP synthase. Uh, this is ATP synthase working in real time. This is. Um, this is the sort of detail that I'm particularly, I'm actually not interested in the technology, I'm really interested in the science. And I find, particularly with the public, if you find little factoid, little interesting nuggets, or able to represent that, that's what people like and what will also find memorable. So this is ATP synthase working in real time, producing around about 100 ATPs a second. So those yellow things are ATP being spewed out, and then these are, little, these are the protons uh, being emitted. So it is watchable in real time, in human, human pace. So uh, that's terrific. Um, it's a really interesting fact, and um, I love these sorts of details. This is really what I search for in my visualizations. It, it just imbue it, fill it with these sorts of uh, details, and it'll come alive at its own core. Okay. Cut to the chase. This is uh, from about two weeks ago. Um, our current system for uh, uh, for visualizing this. This is not meant for showing to explain for, to people what's going on. This is simply a test of our visualization engine. All of this is running in real time on a normal gaming PC. We have a membrane generator, so the, the plasma membrane is being generated automatically. So if, uh, that used to be probably the biggest pain in creating my kind of visualizations is the membrane. Now it's trivially easy. We could have a really simple way of doing that. Uh, we have the ATP synthase running in real time. And we have this thing called the respirosome, which is the, where the main uh, focus of the story is going to be. Uh, this is where, uh, when I showed you that diagram of all the different steps, this is that machinery. And it's, it, it gathers together for efficiency. And there's protons being pumped and protons being pumped out. Um, but essentially, yes, our system is working. Um, we'll be able to use this to where this is a rendered movie. Um, I will have all the control uh, uh, to, uh, that I do for my higher end cinematic style visualizations. But we're really aiming for to have it all running in real time. So again, this is all operating in real time on a normal PC. Oh, this is actually the, 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 this is the hero. This is what I'm uh, most excited about in this story. Uh, but um, 
I'm, uh, I've spent the last 12 months, we've been working actually mostly developing a pipeline to make sure that this integrates CellView or the CellView style system, which is Maya plus Unity, Maya animation software, and Unity is the game engine that's driving all of this. Um, that, developing that pipeline to make sure it works. And now I'm, I've, I'm putting all the scientific details that I want in there. This is a very different workflow from what I usually work. Um, and then as soon as I get back, we have, I have by August, I want to create a cinematic movie, a 16 by 9 movie, that will then, this is the main, next step, is I, where I craft the image to tell the story and to reveal and make sure people are looking where I want them to and so they understand all of this. So this is a, a mess, but it also will show you all the details. Um, so we have the ATP synthase working in real time, but what I'm really interested in is we can, and again, this is all generated in real time, is if we go to a transection, we have a, a, the, the bilipid mem membrane layers, we're going now inside, or actually it's hard to see on this one, for some reason it's not running super smooth. Um, what we have is the protons being pumped out, yeah, you can't see it at all, um, protons being pumped out. So if you're interested in this, come and see me later, I'll show it to you. But essentially, they're being pumped into here. What happens is, because of this membrane, the protons, the, the hydrogen atoms, collide with this and they actually drain down to where the ATP synthase are. So that's why they're creating this, this kink in the membrane under tension is to create to act as a, like a, a drain for all those protons being pumped out here. So they drain to where the ATP synthase are and then they get pumped out. So again, this is all, this is all in real time as it would be occurring inside your cells. And that's the sort of world that I'll be trying to recon, recon, recreate. Um, this is what it looks like in Maya. Um, unfortunately, it's been blown out here. But essentially, what we're doing is I will create a, an ATP synthase uh, at the central axis, and I have all the details I want. We then capture that, uh, maybe 200 or 300 frames on a loop. Um, and then we re-import that polygonal model into Maya, and I can place it wherever we like. And so I can animate secondary and tertiary animation movement. But wherever that, those models are will be replaced on the fly by Unity as, as a visualization engine. Um, and then this, uh, the, 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 uh, the polygonal uh, surface there is the membrane. So all I have to do is create a planar membranes, or a planar polygonal membranes, and they get replaced by bilipid membranes in, in Unity in real time. But essentially this is playing on my laptop here in real time. I can tweak this, I can work with this, I can have cameras, I can work out all the details. And then we pipe it and hand it over to Unity for the rendering. A very different way of working, um, but it's 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 working. <laughs> so this is this is going to be the future for for us for sure. Uh, okay, a couple of other the last bit of technical details. Actually, a little ahead of schedule. Uh, this is um, so this is the respirosome. So you have the ATP synthase, you have the other proteins, and the, for, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of heated discussion vigorous discussion in the literature about how all those different proteins assemble together and there's a very ordered array uh, sort of predicted of how uh, the different components get together. But then you get microscopy like one of the top. The yellow arrows are pointing at the ATP synthase pairs but then these red boxes here are where the respirosomes are and I'm not seeing any order that on the surface of those membranes. But um, uh, you know, so. I, I always go with the real data rather than the speculative models. If the data shows me that, I will do that. So um, that my, my uh, respirosomes, which are these collections here, are currently scattered. But certainly, it, it's, it's absolutely trivial for me to um, move these where it, to create an ordered structure if we wish. Or if a better ATP synthase model comes out, or if there's real data that shows the dynamics of how this machine is working, um, I can easily all of this is upgradable and replaceable on the fly. I can just take this out place a different model and it's up, upgraded automatically. So this will be a model that I will be developing for many years um, to show the interior of the mitochondria, many things to go, many details to go, the genome, uh, the, the citric acid cycle is just me hovering over here on the, uh, above us. Um, but yeah, this is essentially, that's we'll go back and play again. This, this, is a, this is our current technology. This is what we're, we have uh, ambient occlusion, we have motion blur coming, we have transparency coming. So all the sorts of features that I would expect from offline software rendering is all happening in real time. And this is a profound change. Uh, this is our membranes. Um, so again, just creating uh, tubular polygonal surfaces, and they're automatically replaced on the fly with membranes so that we have um, little just models of the lipids, and they then are populated through a shader in Unity in real time. Uh, so membranes, which used to be the big headache, are now trivial to do, which is wonderful. Um, once uh, 
uh, all the various systems that we described during this week of populating uh, these worlds automatically happen, that can definitely be integrated, that will be integrated into this system, so I don't have to do it manually. Currently I'm constructing these membranes man manually and painting where, placing where I want all the different objects to be. Uh, sure, if that can be happen on, in real time or automatically or uh, be generated, I'd totally be up for that. Most of the systems that I use, we, we aim for generative systems where it's out of my hands, it's not hand animated, it's a generative uh, uh, way of producing it. Um, oh, one, I think one last uh, animation, I can play some other stuff, I guess. Um, this, is for about, this is an animation I did a number of years ago about photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is a very much a related, it's kind of the, the, left hand, the right hand of, of energy production on Earth, photosynthesis, where inside our cells, the consumption of, of energy or the generation of energy for consumption, or respiration, um, is using the same sorts of chemicals um, and using a similar sort of process is, is respiration in the mitochondria. But this one I did in 2014 for E.O. Wilson's Life on Earth textbook, um, and it shows you the sort of storytelling, the didactic sort of storytelling anyway, that I'll be doing for mitochondria, at least to give you a sense of that. Sound. Soaking up energy from sunlight, plants and algae generate the oxygen in the air you breathe and turn your carbon dioxide waste into food and fuel. In the green plants you see around you, most photosynthesis chemical reactions happen inside leaf cells. Inside those cells, specialized organelles called chloroplasts absorb photons across folded up membranes. Resembling stacks of coins inside the chloroplasts, thylakoid membranes are where photosynthesis light-dependent reactions occur. Spread across the thylakoid membrane are vast arrays of proteins and pigment molecules that can capture photons and convert light energy into chemical energy. The photon capture system is formed out of precisely arranged chlorophyll pigment molecules. Chlorophyll can absorb the energy of a blue or red photon and pass the energy via a quantum mechanical effect through a chain of pigment molecules to a photosystem II reaction center. The two molecules at the bottom of the reaction center are a chlorophyll special pair. Together, they can use the energy from an absorbed photon to energize an electron and release it up through a chain of acceptor molecules. At the top of the reaction chain, two electrons are accepted by a quinone molecule, which then ferries the energy to other steps in photosynthesis. The loss of an electron by the chlorophyll special pair results in a positive charge because of the missing electron. To replace this lost electron, a nearby cluster of manganese and calcium ions are able to generate electrons by splitting water molecules. Removing four electrons from two molecules of water generates a molecule of oxygen and four protons. A leaf absorbs more than 10 quadrillion photons each second. The energy from those photons powers photosynthesis, maintaining the oxygen you breathe and producing food and fuel for the living biomass of our planet. So this is a very, very similar story, like almost identical kind of story to the one I'm currently telling. Similar sort of proteins, arrays on membranes, electron flows, uh, quinone, the one that was carrying away electrons with, and grabbing hydrogens, they're also, they're, they're exactly in, in mitochondria doing the same sort of story, uh, same sort of job. Um, and so it's, it's going to be the didactic education version will be very much this, showing how electrons flow, showing where protons go, and showing these collections of proteins. But then there's a bigger picture, we have to step back, and that's where the open worlds are going to be really interesting, where we can look around and get a sense of how these things all interact, all the collections of these mesoscale uh, uh, protein structures all work together to do this kind of a process. And that's where uh, the public come in, but very much for high school kids, this, it's going to be this kind of storytelling. Um, with that, I, uh, so again, if you want to see more of my uh, old school traditional animations that we've been doing, wehi.tv is the best place, uh, otherwise, otherwise YouTube. Um, I just really kind of got going with Twitter earlier this year, although I've kind of flamed out a bit, it's a lot of work. Um, I, I still do it though, I'm, I, I still, uh, I'm tending to post quite a bit of uh, behind the scenes of what I'm doing. 
Um, so if, you want to, if you're interested in that, and also just email me if you have any questions. I'll be around all week. I'd be delighted to show you many other things we're up to. Um, and or the current system, the pipeline we have for developing this kind of content. But it really is a transformative, revolutionary time right now. A very different kind of storytelling. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this stuff on the dome and how we actually convey and engage and tell this in a meaningful way, uh, explain these sorts of things to the public. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Drew. Uh, amazing uh, pictures and, a, and an amazing future that we have. We have time for questions. Yes. Hi, I'm not very supposed to introduce ourselves. But yes, I'm, I'm Robert Casaro of Tableau Research. But that was fascinating. It was really fun to watch all these these animations and to like re really understand some of the things that I just heard about but never actually really seen like that. That was amazing. But my question is actually about something totally different, which is the sound. Like you had all these these sounds in the background, like there was this sort of like zooming in to at the, the very last part, of, I think, where there was this kind of background noise of like the machinery working and also, and then there were like certain things, like when the when the electrons moved, there was like this click or this, this beep, and then and so on. So I'm, I'm wondering about how do you use sound to reinforce that, because that seems to be really crucial to how you're working. Uh, yes, so uh, sound is uh, essential to my work, it always has been, um, and it's, that's probably where I stray most from all of you, is I'm very much uh, heading towards uh, art and storytelling with that, and it's very much for engagement of the public, and um, fi sound is 51% of my animations, of making them come alive. Um, I can put all that work into it, but it's silently there. People, like, the difference is, if you play my animations without sound to school kids, because the micro world doesn't really have sound, so it wouldn't be sound. You play it to the students, and they'll sit back and go, yeah, yeah, it's cool. You put sound in, and they immediately lean in towards the screen and go, whoa! And that's the difference. That, that's engagement. And so that's why I use sound. It's very much like color, like framing, all sort of cinematic tricks I pull. Um, but also sound design is very much meant to engage and tell a story and feel, make, make you feel about this stuff. So if you have a cancer cell, um, I will make it sound, or the, the sound designer will make it sound threatening and unpleasant and, and evil. Um, <laughs> if it's if it's or a malaria parasite, for example, will also have its uh, nefarious sounds. These sorts of things, these sorts of uh, proteins I'm showing here, I am trying to emphasize um, the the analogy of of being a molecular machine. So there are clicks and whirs and stuff because it just then will resonate and actually be memorable to the students. Um, so all of my sound design is done by a friend of mine from school days, called Frank Tidez. Um, he is a sound designer for a cinematic film, and but he also, because we shared houses in university days and stuff, we've been doing this forever, he knows the worlds I'm trying to create, um, and I just hand over my silent animations to him and he creates a sound design. But it is, uh, uh, it's like, well, it's the same thing that could be said about color. These are all things that are small in the wavelength of visible light, so color is meaningless. But color is a very, important tool for directing attention to things or to convey a feeling or is it a disease or is it a healthy thing or is it something that's threatening color is very very useful subtle but it will definitely makes a big difference for how people respond to things so these are all artistic choices i make um, and very much uh, the intent of where i'm heading which is um, trying to engage the public and get them to give some sense about what this stuff is about rather than being wringing my hands and saying oh it's not actually really like that so all, all my animations online, you'll see, have sound design, and I could be, that's a whole other lecture. So, um, so uh, if you're interested in that, yeah, check out the YouTube videos or probably ITV. So I'm Henry Kauser from the University of Bergen, and I mean, this was an amazing lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, one aspect of this work which really interests me for many years already is the, 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 the topic of scales, yes. in, in particular temporal scales. Yes. And you touched upon it a little bit when you when you were excited that you show something in real time, which I think is probably the exception in the molecular world, because we have so many small scales uh, also. I was really wondering what your approach is when multiple scales should come together. I mean, some of the, the reactions and the machineries that happen, we, we have both nanoseconds and seconds coming together. How do you do that? Uh, glad you asked. Um, so my other talk, which is another hour, um, is on powers of 10 and powers of 10 zooms and trying to convey multi-scale uh, visualizations, um, trying to achieve that. 
And technically, it's a total, total pain in the ass. It's really, really hard to do. Um, so I've got a whole lecture on powers of 10 zooms and the, the history of doing a powers of 10 zoom to connect our normal perception of the world all the way down to the molecular and back again. Um, and I will just, I will play, uh, indulge myself, I will play one, one last animation, which uh, is a, a it's the first time I achieved. I've done uh, probably six or eight full powers of zooms from our, our perception all the way down to atomic and back again. But this one is the first one that achieved every level of scale. Because particularly when you do a powers of 10 zoom, there's the meso scale where there's not good data. There's not good ways of imaging it and acquiring data. So there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge and you have to fill that in. But there, you can find those sorts of details if you, if you want. So I'll play uh, just one animation. Actually, it will touch on to how you actually present some of these chemical reactions uh, in a story. But also it does a full powers of 10 zoom. It runs for about two, three minutes. Um, uh, and it's on the topic of cellulose and how cellulose is produced by plants. Um, so I'll play that. And that's a much, I, I, have a, I have a lot to say about powers of tens. I'd love to come back to that. And I can show you lots of examples I've been doing, but also other people who have done uh, amazing things with powers of ten. But I do think it's um, really the only way of conveying meaningfully how small this stuff is to people. Um, because you can't explain it's a billion times magnified. It doesn't, billion doesn't mean anything. It's, 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 you can't use it. You can't verbally describe it. You have to show people how small this stuff is. Um, so I'll, I'll play one quick animation. And um, so this was done in 2016. Um, and I can show you all the data that goes into it. But trust me, it's all accurate. Um, <laughs> and it also has some sound design, which may be of interest. polymer on earth made by living things is cellulose. The cellulose molecule is a long flat ribbon made of thousands of glucose subunits linked together into chains. Plants produce cellulose using enzymes to drive the catalytic synthesis reaction. Enzymes are grouped together into symmetrical rings on the outer membrane of plant cells. As the cellulose is generated, it passes through the enzyme from inside the plant cell to outside of the membrane surface. The emerging cellulose molecules are spun together to form strong, flexible fibers. The cellulose fibers are laid down layer upon layer to build up a thick outer cell wall. gives plant cells strength and protection, enabling them to form and hold different shapes. Cellulose makes timber strong for building homes or can be woven into the soft fabric of a cotton shirt. It has been used to make paper for thousands of years, with industrial uses, including explosives and plastics. So this really represents the last of the dinosaur of my old techniques. It was a technical nightmare to pull off. Um, it's really, really hard to do, because the thing is, when you build a lot of stuff, you zoom out, a powers of 10, you need a 1,000, 10,000, a million times more of that stuff and your machine will come to its knees very quickly. Um, but I was able to weave that all together, but it really represents the peak of my old school techniques, and Ivan is going to provide a wonderful way to do this sort of connecting all these different layers of scale together to create a visualization, but I definitely, I've had a long track record of doing powers 10 zooms. It's a hard thing to do, and I'm looking forward to these real-time, well, uh, algorithm-style solutions to doing this kind of visualization, because it is powerful, it's a great way of telling a story, these sort of zooms. Um, but they are hard to do. So with that, I will finish. Thank you.
So thank you very, very much, Drew. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be able to, to announce that together with Drew and with uh, the help of Ivan and his talented team, we will be bringing this stuff real time to a dome near you uh, very, very soon. <laughs> Two years from now. Check it out. Uh, we will now have a short break. Uh, and uh, no? We, we are before schedule, so we will make a long break. Um, and yeah, I, I suggest we make a 30 minutes coffee break and let's be back at uh, 10.55. And for the presenters of the passport, please a little bit early as we don't have to I've been a loser and a legend and I'm kidding, can someone insane?